There may have been fun to fly, but it was clear the next air war would not be decided with biplanes. But monoplanes wouldn't work without much more power. The breakthrough came when Rolls-Royce created an engineering masterpiece, the Merlin. This 24-litre beast created over 1,000 horsepower and opened up exciting new possibilities for aircraft designers. When the Air Ministry put out a specification for a new low-wing monoplane fighter, the first person to take it up was Sidney Cam, the chief designer for Hawkers. Cam had produced most of the most successful aircraft then in service in the RF, both light bombers and fighters. And what he did was to take the basic design of the Hawker Fury and turn it into a monoplane. And the result of this, known first of all as the Fury monoplane, became the Hurricane. And the Hurricane was in a sense a halfway house. The wings were metal, the forward fuselage was metal, but from the middle of the cockpit back, it was actually constructed on wooden slats covered in fabric again. The Hurricane's hybrid approach allowed it to break the magical 300 miles per hour barrier and to carry not just four machine guns, but eight. At last, the RAF hoped it had a plane capable of facing the German menace. As a bomber destroyer, it was very effective indeed. Um, it was easy to fly uh, and it could operate from quite rough uh, airstrips. At the time, in late 1935, it was the fastest thing in the sky. And for about nine months, it captured the imagination of every English schoolboy who saw these things zipping about overhead until, unfortunately, for this, um, this quite attractive but rather plain country girl, along came a real sophisticated catwalking glamour puss from the unlikely stable of a small company based in Southampton that had specialised in seaplanes. This company was Supermarine, who had made their name building the Schneider Trophy race planes in the 20s and early 30s. This was a straight test of speed, and Supermarine had won the competition three times in a row, so claiming the trophy outright for Britain. These planes were the creation of their chief designer, Reginald Mitchell, who now turned his attention to fighters. He set about things in a completely different way from Cam. He decided that rather de than developing a, an aircraft that was already in existence, he had to take a clean sheet and design something from scratch, which was quite unlike anything that had gone before. And the result was probably the most famous aircraft in British history. The Spitfire arrived in the nick of time, mesmerising everyone who laid eyes on it. In 1942, a film was released making Mitchell nearly as famous as his plane. See how they wheel and bank and fly? And all in one. Wings, body, tail, all in one. But you wait. Someday, I'm going to build a place like a bird. Why, it is like a bird. What a strange-looking machine. The Spitfire is remarkable in its combination of speed and manoeuvrability. It was all metal, low wing, a monocoque design, which meant that it was the structure itself that gave the aircraft strength. It was made as small as possible and was designed for speed above all else. His masterpiece was the wing. And the wing of this machine was based on an elliptical shape which was known at the time to be the one shape which produced the lowest induced drag of any other wing shape at subsonic speeds. The Spitfire first flew in 1936, but its designer never saw the true impact of his creation. Mitchell was battling cancer, but refused to let this interfere with his work. This dedication took its toll, and in June 1937, he died aged 42. However, he did live long enough to see the government order 300 Spitfires. His work hadn't been in vain. Congratulations, Mrs Mitchell. Will you thank your husband and tell him that he's given England something that she badly needs? The name was very nearly Shrew. Uh, the name was changed from Supermarine Shrew 
to Supermarine Spitfire. And the person responsible for that was the head of Vickers at the time, a man called McLean, who said that his daughter Anne was a little Spitfire and it was decided to name this aircraft after her. A rather bad-tempered woman, although in the opinion of the pilots she's always been a real lady. Mitchell had only one comment. That's just the sort of bloody silly name they would give it, isn't it? At Headcorn, the boys are getting one last chance to impress Brendan on the Tiger Moth. After three days of trials in the Tiger Moth, Brendan has the task of deciding which of our four young pilots will be going on to fly Mitchell's revolutionary creation. After three days of really hard flying, it's decision time to decide who is going to go forward to fly the Spitfire. There was clearly at the end, although for the first couple of days, it was frankly anybody's. But there was one who was clearly ahead, and that was John. And the reason for that, it did show through, was his professional Air Force training and a great deal of aptitude as well. Ben flew extremely well, again with an Air Force training, very competent, a very nice pair of hands, as we say, in the business, and I would certainly want him as one of my wingmen. Christian, uh, a great character and sport, full of enthusiasm, and I think considering he was the one with the least number of hours, uh, he did extremely well. Dave, who hasn't actually been doing a lot of regular flying lately, I have to say was the one that improved the most in the shortest period of time. Gentlemen, the moment of truth. Two going forward for the Spitfire flying are John and Dave. Well done, both of you. Thank you very much. John, your professional training as an Air Force pilot obviously showed through, as well as a great deal of aptitude. Dave, you actually made the greatest over the period of time. A great job. Well done. Thank you all very much, and well done. Yeah, well done. Are we time to do that kind of stuff? And congratulations. Cheers, mate. This is Officer's Mess, Drem, East Lothian, 21st of June, 1940. Dear Mum and Dad, it's rather nice to belong to a Spitfire squadron because they are fairly few and far between and the Spitfire is still the fastest single-engine fighter, I believe. I've still to make my maiden voyage, but hope to do that tomorrow. Up to now I've flown a tiger moth and a magister around the countryside just to get an idea of the lie of the land. More soon. Love as always. Nigel. For John Sweet and Dave Mallon, it's time to move to Duxford, one of the key Battle of Britain airfields. Today... It's home to the Imperial War Museum's collection of historic aircraft, as well as Carolyn Grace's two-seater Spitfire. As war broke out in 1939, it was clear Mitchell's work hadn't come a day too soon. The salad days of pre-war flying were over. Things were about to get serious. This week, having flown the Tiger Moss last week, you're going to learn to fly Spitfire. By Wednesday, we will have assessed both of your abilities as fighter pilots. We will choose one of you who will then go on to do a full nine hours in the Spitfire of uh, combat training. And at the end of that, you will have about the same amount of hours that a number of the Battle of Britain pilots had when they indeed went to combat. We flew Spitfires straight from biplanes. None of us had ever flown low.